Okay, that was great. So the next uh, talk is going to be from David uh, Shear at Boston University. He's going to be talking about regulatory circuits and cancer. Okay, thanks very much, David. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. I think we all need to be a little bit thankful because we get paid to come down and listen to science like this, which is pretty good. Don't tell anybody outside. So I'm going to talk about the uh, H receptor. Let me get the right button. Middle one, of course. Uh, the H receptor, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail about it because I think most of the people in this audience know, some, know something about it. But at the 50,000 foot level, the HR is a cytosolic protein, the only member, ligand binding member of the PASS family of transcription factors. It's activated by environmental chemicals, most notably things like dioxin which drives it into the nucleus, and then you get expression of so, sets of genes that are fairly canonical, CYP1B1 and CYP1A1. And that's the kind of thing toxicologists usually look at. Now, what I'm going to show you uh, today is that that's not exactly the situation in tumor cells. Nothing happens in these normal cells unless there's a, a ligand added to it. But in tumor cells, they are hyper, AHR is hyper-expressed and hyper-activated. Now, I've been trying to find a way, a graphic that would express uh, what I see in my mind is a hyperactive AHR in these cancers, and I came up with this, which, which clearly looks like a kid who's in the um, gene editing um, candy store that we heard about this morning. So this is what the AHR is doing in most of the tumors that we've looked at, and it's doing that because these tumors make bucket loads of these endogenous ligands that just drive this whole process constitutively. And then what we find in the cancer is bad stuff happens. Now, the reason why this is important to understand how this works is because if we can cut things off here, the bad stuff is not going to happen. And also, if we find out how this does um, mediate these bad outcomes, we can understand how both the endogenous and the environmental ligands work. So what we did then was to evaluate what kind of outcomes you see when you manipulate the AHR. And some of the bad outcomes I was talking about was uh, increased invasion, migration, metastasis, and stemness. And I'll tell you, we've been doing this mostly with triple negative breast cancers, oral cancers. We're doing a little bit in melanoma now and some brain cancer, and the outcomes seem to be pretty much the same. So with these kind of bad outcomes, what you want to do is take the AHR away, uh, find out what kind of um, molecular and biologic outcomes happen downstream, and then design drugs to attack the HR, rather than the other way around, which we heard this morning, which is you have a drug that works, and then you hope it works through the mechanism of targeting the gene you want. Now, we've knocked the HR down in various techniques. We've used siRNA, shRNA. Mark Hahn provided us with HR repressor. All those things work okay. You get 60 to 70 percent, sometimes 75 percent decrease in AHR expression, but it's not all the way. So you see leakiness, and you don't see the kind of granularity you really would like. So then we turn to uh, CRISPR-Cas to really take the AHR away and see what happens downstream. And our strategy is this. Uh, we have taken a couple of target sequences from exon 1 of uh, uh, the human AHR next to our PAM sequences here, here, and over here, uh, hoping for cuts both here and here. We take that construct, put it into a uh, lentivirus uh, vector, do our transfections, select based on puromycin, and then look for clones that have this particular section of the AHR, sorry, right here, this particular section of the AHR gene deleted. And then we confirm everything by um, sequencing. So I'll show you some of the um, quality control that we've been doing uh, once we do this uh, uh, gene knockout. So these are uh, Western blots from three different cell lines. So these are all triple negative breast cell lines, humans. And this guy in particular is very aggressive. It's an inflammatory breast cancer. Survival rate of these things is about two years if, you, if you're diagnosed with it. And we're doing a Western blot here looking for HR in a classic downstream gene CYP1B1. So the wild type's actually in the second lane here. And you can see there's plenty of HR, and there's a little bit of 1B1. And we published now maybe 10 years ago that this 1B1 expression is dependent upon AHR and its constitutive activity. The AHR tends to turn on 1B1 more than any of the other SIPs. But in the AHR knockout, there's nothing happening here. And the AHR and the 1B1 expression is now gone, which actually uh, substantiates what I just told you. Um, you can look at a more profound outcome if you try to treat these cells with an AHR ligand over here, FIZZ. And what you get is the expected upregulation of CYP1B1 in the control, so the wild type control and the CRISPR uh, control here. So everything's working well here, but there's no AHR and there's very little uh, CYP1B1 left. So we're looking at a very high level of uh, deletion of uh, the AHR. And basically, the same patterns here happen with this MDA line 
and at least for the uh, AHR in the HS 578T. So it is relatively easy to do this. It's very consistent and very profound. Okay, what about more activity downstream to really validate the kinds of knockouts you want? So what we did here then was to take these cells and um, look for CYP1A1 either in naive cells or in fizzy uh, treated cells, which activates the AHR. So if you look first at CYP1A1, these first two bars, which you can barely see, are the levels of CYP1A1 in these cells when you don't do any manipulation. When you look in the HR knockout, you can't even see it. There's almost nothing here. If you, if you blow the scale up, you can see that goes to something significant, not nothing, down to nothing. CYP1B1 is a little bit easier to target or easier to detect. And as I said, the constitutively active HR tends to turn on CYP1B1 more than CYP1A1. And you can see the baseline levels here in the HR knockout that just goes away. In the AHR uh, ligand activated or hyperactivated state, you get this big upregulation of CYP1A1 and CYP1B1, and there's almost no uh, signal in the uh, AHR knockout. And the same thing is true, we won't go through it, but the same thing is true for the HS578T and the MDA, MB231 cell. So it's really, it's really a very effective knockout, and that gave us confidence to do some more biologic experiments where we now we're going to look for things that aren't quite so subtle as when we're using siRNA. So the first thing we did was to use these matrigel assays. And you take the human tumor cells, you put them in matrigel, and the very aggressive uh, tumors will start digging their way through the matrigel, and you get these very irregular colonies being formed that look like this. So this is a wild-type control, and this is a CRISPR control. They can grow in pretty much any direction. But the HR knockout, they grow nicely. They grow in nice little balls that if this were a real tumor, your surgeon can take it out and you're perfectly okay. So that was encouraging, and we never quite saw that level of the phenotype before. Interestingly, when we made CYP1B1 knockouts, we saw kind of a similar phenotype, and I just wasn't expecting that. I thought there was going to be a negative control, as usual. <laughs> uh, don't know what that's about, but that's really interesting to suggest that CYP1B1, in some way by itself, controls some of the downstream effects that you see in cancer. We're going into a triple negative uh, cell line here called HS578T. And it grows very ugly here in the wild type and the CRISPR knockout. It's more or less the same in multiple fields. And then the CRISPR AHR knockout, they just sit there like balls. And they're not dying. They're fine. They're perfectly fine. They just don't want to dig out into the major gel. And the CYP1B1, well, it turns out to be sort of a little bit in between. OK, so now that you know, we've been able to show that, OK, if you take the AHR down, you do get these very profound biologic outcomes. You want to design a drug then that's going to mimic that kind of thing, which is what we did. Um, uh, in collaboration with Hercules that has now uh, licensed our AHR inhibitors. And in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a co-founder of Hercules. And we do use multiple ways to try to identify molecules that could bind to the AHR with relatively high affinity. This was our first generation drug. We'll just call it CB and the second generation called HB163. So we then said, can these, can these inhibitors do the same kind of thing as an AHR knockdown? And of course, the answer is yes. So we're looking here in the major gel assays. This is an aggressive triple negative breast cancer. And you can see this one really grows with these sort of pseudopods going out there. But if you treat with our CB compound, they just form nice little round balls and just sit there. This is the most aggressive tumor we've ever looked at. It's a bone tropic uh, MDA MB231. Uh, just to give you a comparison, this is the picture you get in three days as opposed to six days up here. So this is a real bad actor. But he behaves pretty well, too, in the presence of CB7993113. What about another? Um, uh, readout of aggressiveness of these tumors. One of them is their ability to migrate. So you do this very simple assay, low-tech stuff, you're really opposite of gene editing. You take cells, you put them on a, uh, uh, in a tissue culture plate till they reach a monolayer, you scratch them down the middle, and then you watch the cells on the outside undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition and then start migrating across. And you measure how fast it is they can migrate across. So that's what we've done. And here, so the original scratch here is these dotted lines across the top. And this is the wild type. And you can see all these cells moving together. There's about 24 hours here. And uh, in this particular uh, type of tumor cell, the SOM149 cells, in about 40 hours, it'll completely come back across. CRISPR knockout is, uh, of the CRISPR control is about the same. But then when we knocked 1B1 out, again, a little hard to see with these lights on, but it's sort of an intermediary phenotype. And the HR knockout, you can see pretty clearly that there's still a lot of space in here. If we quantify this by doing imaging and then calculating the amount of space that's still open, and you can see that at 48 hours, which is this, uh, the gray bar here, the, one, the 1B1 knockout has a little bit more open space, 
sometimes a little more profound in some of the other lines, but it's trying to do that. The HR knockout, it's almost the same as uh, when we first did the scratch. Will the uh, drugs that we've developed do the same kind of thing? Well, it looks like they do. You can look just over here at 48 hours, and you can see that this HS578T line, triple negative breast cancer, has basically come all the way across the, the uh, scratch. In this case, the scratch is vertical, not horizontal. Uh, and when you use sort of the gold standard AHR inhibitors, a lot of space open here, and, the, and our inhibitor, a lot of space open. And with this really aggressive inflammatory breast cancer, you can see the same outcome. That's the control. That's our, one of the inhibitors. That's another one of the inhibitors. So with this level of biologic outcome, we said, okay, th this is the, the system in which we really want to start figuring out which genes are regulating these very uh, aggressive behaviors. So what we did first is start looking for uh, genes that are associated with epithelial uh, to mesenchymal transition. And you get this, a very, oops, you get this very clear um, pattern, a very clear outcome of certain genes that are very significantly downregulated, like WNT5B. All right, so that, we know WNT is important in, in various tumors. But for the AHR to regulate that uh, is a big step towards understanding how the AHR works and actually makes a lot of sense in terms of cancer as does the MMP or uh, metal proteinases 9 and 2. There was a gene that went up by about 20-fold here. That's keratin-14. And then when you come back and do the qPCR to validate that, you see, yeah, in fact, the WNT5B has a high constitutive level, but you knock the AHR down and it goes away. And interestingly, the 1B1 knockout also seemed to decrease that, some, that somewhat. So again, we keep getting this message, message that CYP1B1 is mediating some of these effects at least for some genes and some cell lines. For example, if you look in the MMP9, you see the decrease with the AHR knockout, but you don't see the decrease with the CYP1B1. So I guess the, the word of the day is uh, it's complicated. We also looked at uh, stem cell uh, associated genes. And the reason we did this is because we've published papers that, that show that the AHR drives stemness in cancer cells. Stemness in cancer cells is a bad thing. You don't want cancer stem-like cells, whatever you want to call them, because those are the guys that are chemo-resistant and they come back 10 years later when you think you're in the clear. And the HR seems to drive some of the uh, characteristics of um, stemness. So he said, okay, let's do the stem cell, uh, stem cell gene analysis. And in fact, uh, the thing that you see change the most going down 43-fold is a gene called ABCG2. That's a chemical transporter. That's a gene that's directly responsible for pumping cytotoxic drugs, for example, out of the cell. So we think at least this chemo resistance is mediated through ABCG2, and I'm only showing you some of the genes. I can't show you the whole thing, but the gestalt is you get much finer granularity when you knock the HR down 95 plus percent than you do with siRNA, SH, or, or any other technique. Okay, and that's just a confirmation of that. So then we decided, okay, let's get a little bit bigger and use this, um, use this full knockout to really get the full spectrum of genes that are driven by the AHR. So a lot of people have tried to do this, and we've all had some success at it, but it's never been just quite perfect. And what we wanted to do then was to take some of these tumor cells, like SUM149 inflammatory breast cancer, knock the AHR out, and then look at the total sum of the genes that change. So we took 644 genes, all of which changed with a false discovery rate of 0.05, and said, we're going to call that an AHR um, signaling profile. And then we said, okay, let's go to the TCGA. In the TCGA, you can take tumors, and you can identify the infiltration of various kinds of leukocytes based on the appearance of a profile. So if you're looking for macrophage infiltration into a tumor, you have something like 30 genes that define macrophages. And when those genes are up, you know there's a lot of tumor infiltration. So there's a lot of algorithms that will tell you what the infiltration is. So then we took our 644 genes that are regulated by the HR, and we said, are those things correlated with infiltration of any leukocytes? And I'll tell you the reason we want to do this is because we've shown and other people have shown over a period of time that the AHR is really important for an immune response. And more and more, it's becoming clear it's critical for immune responses to tumors. And sort of the bottom line of what I end up telling you is we think the AHR is a new immune checkpoint, and our inhibitor would be a new immune checkpoint inhibitor. So we thought, OK, what happens if we either treat these cells? Well, let me show you the result with the correlation first. So the correlation between these 644 genes that change in the, in the human breast cancer cell and infiltrating uh, neutrophils is very, very significant. And that's not uh, a trivial point, because these neutrophils are also generally known as myeloid-derived suppressor cells. 
I'm just going to be a little careful because we haven't shown the function yet, but if you see a lot of neutrophils in this particular model, it's likely that they're going to be these uh, suppressive cells. And similarly, if you go to, oops, backwards. If you go to uh, human oral cancer cells, you see the strong correlation between AHR activity, so the AHR profile, and infiltrating macrophages. And particularly in this system, that's really important because a lot of the cells that infiltrate these tumors are, in fact, immunosuppressive macrophages. So that gave us the sort of the confidence to go ahead and do the $15,000 experiment, which is going in vivo. And I'm sure I don't have to tell everybody in this audience it's a whole lot better to do the bioinformatics and all the calculations for, first to see if it's real world, and then you go back and see what you can find out in the model. So what we did was to take, uh, in this case, an oral cancer line. And this is, I think, the only mouse oral cancer line available. It was made by Ravi Upalori at uh, Dana-Farber, who was generous enough to give it to us. And uh, you take these tumor cells, you inject it orthotopically, so into the tongues of immunocompetent mice. And then you either treat the mice with uh, one of your inhibitors, or instead of injecting a wild-type um, tumor, you inject a uh, tumor cell that has the AHR knocked out through CRISPR-Cas. And here's the result of that um, experiment. This is the growth curve of these oral cancer cells in immunocompetent mice over a period of about 50 days. If you treat with our inhibitor, it stays down for a really a long time. This sort of starts coming back up like this. But if you knock the AHR out of the tumor itself, you get bupkis. You get nothing coming out, no tumors whatsoever. Is this due to any kind of immunity that's being generated? We're in the process of trying to determine that right now, but it looks like it might be. So if you look at the draining lymph nodes of these mice, these guys out here, and look for these myeloid-derived suppressor cells, you can see that there's a significant decrease in uh, these cells that probably are myeloid-derived suppressor cells. That's why I have an L here. So it's myeloid-derived suppressor-like cells, to be a little bit cautious. Significant decrease in the AHR knockout. And then if you look at the CD4, CD8 cells, for example, you see the significant increase in the draining lymph nodes. And there's other outcomes that are consistent with all this. I won't have time to show you. So the summary here is CRISPR-Cas9 knockdown or knockout is wicked good. Robust knockout results in robust biologic, biologic and molecular changes. Robust biologic and molecular changes increase confidence in additional therapeutic applications. And if you didn't get it the first time, knockdown is wicked good. And most importantly, I want to thank the people who actually have done the work. The work I'll show you to, I showed you today was done by Jan Wong, a great uh, senior PhD in, uh, in my laboratory. Olga Novikov, who's just about to get her MD, uh, PhD degree. Ooh. Um, Liz Stanford here, who's now an assistant professor at Northeastern. The, um, the computational work was done by Stefano Monte, who's a member of our uh, uh, Boston University Woods Hole Superfund Research Program. Mark Hahn, who's the real AHR guru, guru in our Superfund uh, group. And um, yep, one more time. And the people who funded, of course, NIH and Find the Cause Breast Cancer Foundation and Hercules who supplied the uh, drug. So I'll happy to answer questions now or later.